released uh, this year that we're growing faster than expected. So we're going to hit uh, 500,000, not just in 2031 uh, or 2029, as it was then re re revised down to, but actually 2027. So we're going to have more people living in our city. We need to find new ways of moving larger numbers efficiently around our city and public transport plays a critical role in that as does active transport and we've been out consulting on a draft uh, active travel plan as well. Um, we've, been, we've got a variety of different things happening across uh, ACT government that I wanted to update you on and there's a lot of exciting updates uh, this, uh, today that uh, the whole general public has not seen yet. I uh, understand that Major Projects Canberra came and presented to you uh, at an earlier meeting, um, now a number of meetings ago, um, about where things were up to, particularly with light rail stage 2A, and I'm, I'm really pleased to provide you with a further update tonight. The government is committed to bringing uh, light rail uh, down to Woden, starting uh, with building light rail stage 2A to Commonwealth Park. Uh, and work has already begun on raising London Circuit, which is a critical part of uh, making sure that we can have a platform to extend light rail from London Circuit onto Commonwealth Avenue. This is a slide showing our journey uh, thus far, some of those milestones you'll be um, familiar with. Uh, in, we released the Stage 2A business case uh, in August 2019 and since then we've been working through uh, the various environmental and planning uh, processes uh, including for Raising London Circuit, which we decided to split out as a separate project to uh, the, the actual Stage 2A uh, project proper. Uh, we most recently have signed a contract in July 2022 for five new light rail vehicles, which was the uh, contract uh, with Canberra Metro and the Spanish tram manufacturer CAF. Uh, to build us five new light rail vehicles so we can deliver the same frequency of service that people currently enjoy on stage one on the extension to Conmore Park. Importantly, what we funded under that contract as well was a retrofitting of the existing fleet of 14 light rail vehicles for stage one uh, with the onboard energy systems that will allow us to run wire free on st stage 2A from Olympia Street to Commonwealth Park, but also uh, on the future extension, of course, on through 2B, through the Parliamentary Triangle, uh, which will be a great outcome, I think, um, for the community and not having those poles and wires in that sort of heritage uh, area and does uh, mean cost less to put up those uh, poles and wires despite the extra costs of the, um, of the onboard energy systems themselves. And of course, the latest major milestone has been that we've started construction on Raising Garden Circuit uh, in October. Um, so works are well underway uh, there and we're uh, expecting the first major disruption as a result of that construction work starting on the 2nd of December. So we've been out there already um, having hundreds of conversations with local businesses around the construction footprint in particular, but also beyond that with government departments and the parliamentary triangle, uh, to ask uh, employees, to ask Canberrans to rethink their routine starting from the 2nd uh, of December, because it will have a start to have an impact on the traffic network as we build this important uh, project for Canberra's future. In terms of the journey ahead, uh, we'll continue to progress uh, the delivery of light rail to Woden and um, there's some exciting milestones uh, coming up. So we've got the expected, um, looking, looking at ASH, making sure we confirm we're right for December to lodge the works approval application to the National Capital Authority for Stage 2A. Uh, and this will be, of course, to get the approval to all those Stage 2A systems, the light rail stops, the track, the track slab, uh, the, uh, the light rail systems that we need to build following uh, the raising of London Circuit. Uh, that is expected to go out for uh, public consultation through the NCA's uh, process as well uh, and with the aim of receiving approvals around quarter to uh, 2023. We're of course continuing to negotiate with Canberra Metro for the Stage 2A uh, contract as well and we're expecting that um, we'll be able to finalise that procurement following the works approval being granted uh, by the NCA. Uh, we've also ahead in terms of milestones we've got the construction of the depot expansion which was part of that contract for the new light rail vehicles uh, that will commence in 2023 to make sure we've got the room at Mitchell to 
uh, cater for the growing fleet of light rail vehicles. Uh, and then the first new uh, light rail vehicle will arrive in 2024. And at that point, uh, we can start substituting those into our existing fleet. Uh, and then we can start retrofitting the existing fleet with those onboard energy systems by taking them out of uh, service for a period of time. And that uh, is expected, the total retrofitting time frame is expected to take around four years. So that gives you a sense about what the timing will be for the start of operations for stage uh, 2A. So around two years for construction of Racing London Circuit and around two years after that uh, for stage uh, 2A to start operations. The specific delivery time frame for uh, stage 2A commencing operations is subject to us, uh, of course, receiving that works approval from the NCA in a timely manner, but also signing a contract and finalising the procurement with Canberra Metro for uh, the delivery of stage 2A. And of course, uh, that's when we can sign in a contract. The expected delivery time frame, or the, the, the delivery time frame that we expect uh, should be delivered by the contract. Um, partners. Um, so we're looking forward to that occurring next year and we're looking forward to updating the community with a more specific time frame around uh, what, what uh, quarter and what month uh, we expect operations to commence for stage uh, 2A. The first step of course of enabling uh, stage 2A is to raise London Circuit uh, up to form that at grade intersection uh, to uh, provide a platform for light rail to move from Commonwealth Avenue onto London, uh, from London Circuit onto Commonwealth Avenue. Um, but it's also going to provide other benefits for the city, which you'll see in this slides ahead, particularly making sure that we've got a more people-friendly uh, southern part of our CBD for pedestrians, for cyclists, uh, and for public transport. And at the moment, there's a six metre high wall that blocks people moving from the city to the, through to the lake. Uh, it's a physical barrier that is um, very challenging. Uh, and of course, it wasn't part of the original uh, plans for Canberra by Burley Griffin. It was a later retrofit of an LA style boat belief interchange, which uh, we are taking out in order to make sure that we've got um, a improved southern end of our CBD. And we're hoping it will add to an improved landscape, improved um, vibrancy of that southern section. And what it will mean is that effectively people will, when they're moving from the southern part of the city into the city, they'll hit the CBD a little bit earlier than they would have uh, beforehand. Um, I talked a little bit about the uh, depot and uh, LRV uh, modifications, um, but there are obviously, there's a significant amount of work um, associated with that. Um, and there's a little, there's a few dot points there about um, exactly what uh, that means. Um, going back to stage 2A, uh, once we've completed um, that work, of course the extension involves an, ext an extension of the line by 1.7 kilometres uh, through the western side of London Circuit. Uh, it'll be wide free, as I've mentioned, uh, running on 100% uh, renewable energy. Uh, it will require us to put in some more um, uh, electrical infrastructure to support um, the extension of the energy needs uh, of the system as well. And we're currently examining exactly where those potential extraction stations uh, need to go, um, potentially on the stage one route, not on the stage two A route. Uh, improvements, um, of course, in to, through London Circuit will include traffic signalling, uh, road and footpath improvements and extra tree plantings. We've been doing a lot of work with the National Capital Authority both on stage 2A but also on stage 2B is uh, already on the landscape plan um, for uh, the Commonwealth Avenue area um, and they're looking closely at how we can meet the original heritage intention uh, of this area as a major gateway uh, into the southern part of the city down to the tree species and where things should be planted based on the actual Burley Griffin um, uh, landscaping uh, design. So we're really excited about that and the opportunity to try and have a, a great canopy cover on what is actually quite a bare medium at the moment on Commonwealth Avenue and, um, and also beyond on, on 2B as well. Now I'm going to show you um, a few different slides of what we expect things to look like. This hasn't been seen yet so you're getting a sneak preview of what uh, is likely to be part of the uh, final submission to, through the NCA. Uh, which will then go out for uh, public consultation. 
This is a slide uh, of North Lawn Place looking south of Olinga Street uh, on the extension. Um, so the crossing there of Olinga Street with the um, sort of red uh, maroon there. Uh, you can get a glimpse of the uh, green, uh, the first section of green track, which will be the first uh, section that we'll have on the uh, light rail route, which is very uh, exciting uh, there. Uh, and then, of course, um, it will move through uh, onto London Circuit from there, turning, uh, turning right. Go to the next slide. Uh, and then we've got the yeah, Edinburgh Avenue uh, stop there. So it moves uh, down the western edge of uh, London Circuit in the median. This is the first section where it's running on the road. So we haven't actually experienced that much in Canberra with our light rail system. Um, it's not a tram system. It does mostly run in its own uh, dedicated corridor with, um, with uh, traffic signals that will allow it to move through ahead of vehicles, but this section it will have to move onto the road. So we're, we're moving from what is currently a, um, a two, lanes, two lanes each way configuration on the road. We're taking out a lane uh, in, the, in the centre, which will be for the light rail vehicles. It's a very narrow street, and uh, you can see that here in the, the render of uh, the western side of London Circuit. We have to try and fit in uh, a whole range of different um, services. We can just go back to Edinburgh Avenue if that's all right. Thank you. Um, we're trying to fit in a whole range of different services, which has been a bit of a challenge for the designers. Um, this is a design that I think most people would be familiar with if they uh, have gone down to Melbourne uh, at any point and seen the tram system that operates there, light rail system that operates there. So um, it's. We've got two um, stations uh, either side uh, of the track, um, and it's a reasonably narrow uh, road either side um, for motor vehicles. Um, and so it will be a very low speed environment, and the road environment really speaks to it being you know, a pedestrian zone. There's, there's people crossing across the tracks in order to access uh, light rail. We'll move on to the city stop. Um, so this is the, the stop that the light rails come up from the western side of London Circuit and just come onto Commonwealth Avenue. There's a stop planned uh, there, um, which will uh, not immediately, I think, be used, um, but certainly will provide access to the future uh, Acton waterfront uh, development. Uh, and, and it may be used by also people walking from the eastern side of London Circuit as well. And there's actually a fair bit of um, residential development that is planned on that side of the city uh, so that people can uh, access um, that stop. And then uh, beyond that, uh, moves to the last stop, which is Commonwealth Park. Um, so this is a stop um, uh, next to the, the car parks there um, uh, near the uh, near the park at the moment um, and we've been talking very closely with the NCA about what the design outcome that we want here. We want to make sure that we had a, a safe um, crossing. There is an existing uh, traffic light uh, arrangement there which is uh, used now all throughout the year but was, um, was put in place to support particularly people moving through to major events in Commonwealth Park like Florida. So it shouldn't change the uh, traffic and traffic um, conditions in a significant way through the introduction of that stop, but we do expect there'll be more people sort of crossing across Commonwealth Avenue. Mentioned the landscape, um, which is we've been working uh, closely on. So, um, so we've got the ra newly raised Commonwealth uh, Avenue and London Circuit intersection there, which is an at grade intersection. Uh, once that once that's complete, moving through south. Uh, here um, to the Commonwealth Park stop. So as you can see, there's plantings for the first time in the median strip uh, of trees, uh, as well as additional part plantings on the uh, edges and in the actual um, intersection itself. So we're hoping that this will achieve um, some of the landscape outcomes that um, uh, the National uh, the Heritage Area and National Capital um, Plan Protected intersections will be part of uh, our NCA works approval. So you may have seen uh, that in the Raising London Circuit uh, works approval that we've obtained and we've started work on uh, on that project already. Um, we hadn't included protected intersections uh, in that. That's, that was based on feedback from the NCA. 
Uh, we've been working with them closely about the merits of protected intersections, and what I mean by that is a protected intersection for cyclists and pedestrians, um, particularly for the cycle paths. Um, and you can see that there will be two of those, uh, so, so North um, London Circuit, North One Avenue intersection, and then South at the, North, at the Commonwealth Avenue and London Circuit intersection. This is part of a new uh, design standard that we want to apply to uh, a range of intersections around Canberra where there is high pedestrian and cyclist movement. Um, what it does is it's safe infrastructure for walking and cycling and it's one of the ways that we know that we can actually promote uh, more people to get out and, and cycle in our community. Uh, and what, because one of the whole purposes of raising London Circuit was to try and provide safe connections for people walking and cycling, we wanted to make sure that we had the best infrastructure design possible. And um, I think there's a, yeah, there's a, that's a example on the northern side of London Circuit with Northbourne uh, Avenue uh, about what that design will look like. So you can see uh, that there are protected, uh, protected intersections here where there's a dedicated cycle lane uh, separated from pedestrians so that they feel safe to walk uh, across the road as well. Uh, and this is, these are going to be some of the first examples of these types of uh, interceptions in Canberra. So we're really excited about this and what's, what can be achieved at the uh, London Circuit, Commonwealth Avenue intersection. So this is the first time people have seen the render of this one. Uh, and this is what we're hoping to get uh, agreement from the National Capital uh, Authority for um, the buildings, um, the ghosts of buildings will not look like that. I can tell you that now. So just be, this is, uh, I suspect it will be less intrusive than that um, in, in the active waterfront um, development, which is obviously a lot of a bit of planning uh, to do to, to finalise what that will look like. But certainly there will be more people living uh, on that side of Commonwealth Avenue. And uh, we're expecting them to use that city south stop uh, just there, uh, as well as people from the eastern um, side of the CBD. We'll move on to uh, so some of the traffic uh, impacts. So uh, there's an existing traffic light uh, at, at the Commonwealth um, Park stop already, so that's uh, not a significant difference. Obviously, we're putting in new traffic lights with the raised London circuit arrangement. Uh, with Commonwealth at the intersection of Commonwealth Avenue, which will be in that grey, that level intersection. Um, we're putting in two new uh, traffic light uh, traffic light intersections at London Circuit on West Road, London Circuit and University Avenue as well, which again will, uh, which hopefully will provide better safety for pedestrians and cyclists as well. Uh, and this is consistent, I guess, with the design of um, stage one, where um, I guess the, the principle was that um, people shouldn't be allowed to, or motorists shouldn't be allowed to turn across the uh, light rail alignment unless they're following a green signal. Um, so it will improve safety for motorists, make sure that we try and avoid uh, collisions uh, of, into the light rail vehicle. Unfortunately, we still see that a little bit even where there are signals telling people not to, uh, to cross the alignment. Um, so the net, as I said, the next steps we will be to um, to get those works approvals and um, finalise the contract negotiations. I think the community is going to be excited to see some of the images that we've put up for the first time tonight in that and we're looking forward to getting their feedback. It's not the end, uh, end point, there's still this last opportunity for people to give their feedback on the final uh, proposition. Uh, and of course the NCA may, may put their conditions uh, on that works approval as well. Uh, we'll we look forward to, to, to seeing if there are any that we need to um, need to address uh, and then of course we'll once we've got the stage 2a um, approvals we've got the contract signed then we can make sure that MPC Ash's team uh, and also our, our delivery partners our technical design partners ACOM can to then turn their attention for 2b now 2b so uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, 2B um, tonight. Um, obviously, this is a critical part of getting uh, light rail to load, and it was always going to be the most complex part from a plan planning uh, point of view uh, and from a design uh, point of view. 
that's the reason why we split stage two into two parts, 2A and 2B, because we knew that 2A was going to be a much simpler proposition. Uh, and so that we could get underway with stage 2A while we continue to uh, work on getting um, the, the planning approvals and undertaking the design for 2B. Uh, we've already started that to some extent um, with work that major projects Canberra has been doing with the NCA around their bridge strengthening uh, project. Uh, so at the same time that we're constructing light rail stage 2A, the NCA uh, will also be undertaking their major uh, project to um, improve uh, Commonwealth Avenue Bridge, widen the wings of the bridge for pedestrians and cyclists, which is very consistent with what we're trying to achieve with our project, and also uh, the bridge strengthening work that they need to do to update um, that bridge. It's going to have more traffic volume in the future, heavier loads, um, and it's a bridge that was, of course, um, designed sort of around the 1960s. So um, we've been, we know that we need to get over the lake uh, into, into Parliamentary Triangle. We've been very clear that our intention is the same intention as the original designers of the bridge, which is to build a third uh, inset bridge in between the two Commonwealth Avenue bridges uh, to get over uh, Lake Burley Griffin into the Parliamentary Triangle. And so we've been undertaking quite a bit of heritage work with the NCA so that we're both consistent with the heritage values of the bridge uh, and that will also inform the environmental impact statement which we need to develop for stage 2B. We've also been doing the work on the landscape uh, proposition for stage 2B as well and um, there's certainly some interesting things that have come out of that about uh, what the potential is around some of the clover leaves on the southern part uh, southern end of um, Commonwealth uh, Bridge, not just the northern end that we're dealing with with Raising, Raising London Circuit, uh, and the opportunities there again to try and uh, be consistent with the original design of this part of Canberra by uh, Burley Griffin. So we're very excited about um, that happening uh, and being able to shift our focus once we've got um, stage 2A um, underway. Um, we'll still be keeping a very close eye on the contractors there, the team, but we'll be able to shift our focus on to getting on with some of those planning uh, approvals that are required, which include, I mean, sorry, we'll go back to that slide in a second. Sorry, I might actually, I'll deal with this now. So we've, we've got a little bit of work to do on the design um, still on stage 2B. Um, we, we know that the National Capital Plan um, transport uh, route, which we had sort of consulted with the community on and um, the Joint Parliamentary Committee um, is the State Circle route around um, Parliament House um, down to Adelaide Avenue and down to Woden. Um, and that was, um, we got feedback from the Joint Parliamentary Committee on the Territories that that was their preferred uh, alignment in the past. We got feedback from the NCA that that was uh, going to be consistent with their view as well. So that was what we were proceeding with. We've since, there's since been a change of government. There's since been changes to uh, members uh, of the National Capital Authority Board. Uh, and there's been a new, new, new chair of the Joint Parliamentary um, Committee on the Territories. Um, that opens up the um, possibility of reopening a discussion about the exact route uh, and alignment that Stage 2B should take through the Parliamentary Triangle what the uh, costs and benefits of, those, uh, group, of that group uh, should be. Um, and we are very interested in looking at what the options are. Um, so state, the state circle route has a number of challenges uh, to it. Uh, the first uh, of those is that there's a net very narrow gap um, from when, you, when, the, when the light rail uh, track transitions from Commonwealth Avenue onto state circle. Um, and so that, from a technical point of view, is, is very challenging. Um, it would then go or have to go on to the verge uh, on the Parliament House side of the verge on State Circle. Uh, and that, of course, invokes the need to get the extra plan, set of planning approvals by having both House of Parliament voting on in support of the project. Um, and the reason for that is because there's, there's things on the other side of the verge like the church that make it very difficult for us to run on the other side. Uh, and there are a, a, a range of extra costs that are required um, as well um, for that uh, alignment. Um, it is still the preferred alignment at this point in time. 
but we are going to open up um, a discussion about whether we should also examine the option um, as we progress with some of the uh, early design and, um, and planning about uh, the, what was, I guess, affectionately known as the dog leg um, option, uh, which is presented behind me. And I guess the key benefits um, of this are that it brings the light rail stops, the three light rail stops uh, within the sort of parliament, or four light rail stops within the parliamentary triangle, closer to where people are working and, and live. Um, and that's sort of, I guess, demonstrated through the sort of light purple and dark purple um, blotches on, on the map. Um, so it might make it easier for more people to access the light rail route, which is a, which is a good public transport outcome. Um, this route uh, is proposed to go sort of just through near the old Parliament House and then uh, move through. And you might have seen the federal budget. There was a very significant announcement about a new government office building um, precinct, which would have catered for thousands of people living directly on the light rail line. And so there's an opportunity to make sure that they have really great access uh, into um, the light rail route as well. It potentially adds a slight time cost uh, through the parliamentary triangle uh, for those who are travelling through um, to Loden, um, and but it also potentially would cost less than going up on the state um, circle route to actually build um, this um, potential option. So we're going to examine that as part of um, the work that we will start to do on, on 2B um, and uh, work, work closely with the NCA, work closely with the Joint Parliamentary Committee on the Territories to uh, examine the costs and benefits um, of that potential route as we move um, forward. Go to the next slide. This is a, uh, a great, graph, a great uh, diagram because it shows the complexity of what we're dealing with on 2B in terms of the approvals. Um, it is the most complex project um, from a planning approval point of view uh, in Australia because of the um, overlay of the NCA, National Capital Plan, and the parliamentary um, precincts. Um, so we get, it is a very complex path that we're trying, having, to walk, having to walk through uh, at each stage, and, um, and we're looking forward to starting, starting that as, as soon as we can uh, to make sure that we get decisions in a timely way, but the reality is that the decisions are out of our hands, um, largely they're undertaken by third parties, um, and that makes it a very complex project, and, very, and it adds risk to the project. As a result of that, um, it, we are likely to consider a business case for 2B after we've gone through the planning approvals process, uh, and after we've undertaken a certain level of design um, as well to make sure that we cover off on um, some of the risks before we then sign a business case and go into um, procurement. The reality of the current infrastructure market is that uh, prices for delivering infrastructure projects for all the different components, steel and uh, concrete and so forth, asphalt, all the things that are required are going up um, significantly. We want to make sure that the, the the point we're making decisions on business place that's as close to the point of uh, procurement um, as possible. Um, you might note that the 2A business case was uh, released in August 2019. Now, some years later, that we're actually just finalising the procurement, and there, there, as a result, will be you know obvious cost escalation that's occurred during that period that will be reflected. And we want to make sure we reduce that cost escalation, reduce that risk as much as possible. Um, so a slightly different approach on, on 2B to 2A um, that you'll be seeing. I'll move on. I won't try to explain that diagram. It's just uh, something that our project managers are across. Um, disruption. Uh, look, you're going to start seeing that disruption in the CBD. Um, this is a challenge uh, for any major infrastructure project in the country. We've seen in uh, states like Victoria where they really used the disruption associated with big rail projects, big infrastructure projects, to give people the information that they need to, to help minimise the impact of that disruption on their community and their lives, but at the same time, explaining the benefits of those projects for the community. Because when you're caught up in disruption, you, you, your attention is there, and we'll certainly be using this opportunity to explain, we're not just building this project to create a whole bunch of disruption, 
we're building it to build a better connected, vibrant, sustainable city. Uh, as we raise London Circuit, as we build light like, rail stage 2A, as we're going to take other infrastructure projects around um, the city, building the new hospital, uh, building the Canberra Theatre precinct right next to the southern part of the CBD where this disruption's happening. So um, we've been working through the disruption task force, which we set up very early on to prepare and plan for what's ahead. And uh, a lot of lot of thinking has gone into some of the you know, physical infrastructure that we put in, like the new traffic lights on Vernon Circle, uh, new traffic lights that are going in on um, the major bottleneck on Passway, the Corrandirk roundabout, um, to try and manage the expected extra uh, impacts um, on Parks Way um, with less capacity uh, on Commonwealth Avenue due to the works that are going to be happening. And of course, we'll be asking the people to rethink their routine to think about how and when they travel into the CBD. We're still encouraging people to come into the CBD to, um, to work and to shop and to, um, to meet other people. Um, but people just need to think a little bit, a little bit harder about that, plan their trip, providing as much information as we can on a regular basis, including on the road through the variable message signing, but on the radio and often on a daily basis about exactly where the construction program is, which will change over time. And um, so while some of the roads will be shut, the southern end of London Circuit from the 2nd of December, and all of those clover, not all of the clover leaves, but the two clover leaves um, that provide access into City East and City West on Commonwealth Avenue, um, that's the 2nd of December. And then next year, we'll, we'll, there'll be further um, impacts as we demolish the first bridge on Commonwealth Avenue over London Circuit to raise London Circuit. We are expecting, though, this is a great piece of work that the team has done uh, with, the, with Abigail, who's helping us to deliver the project, is at all times we expect that there will be um, two lanes each way uh, throughout uh, the construction. Uh, at one point, we really thought there was going to be one lane um, in one direction and two lanes in the other, so uh, we're actually building like a side track uh, on, on one of the bridges to enable that to happen to try and reduce the, the disruptive effect. But as I said, the NCA is doing their works. We expect them to take out lanes on their bridge at some point in time, so um, to do that work. And so we'll be working closely to try and minimise uh, that disruption as much as possible. Moving on from light rail, I wanted to touch on uh, network, uh, the network changes, timetable changes that are being uh, put in place for term one next year. Um, this uh, is very much informed by the disruption that we uh, expect will be experienced by public transport through our bus routes. Um, it will take longer for a bus to complete its route. Um, we expect that's around eight minutes coming from the south uh, into the city and sort of around four minutes, five minutes um, coming from the north. That extra travel time um, has been factored into um, the timetable um, for term one. Um, and it means that um, we, we are still delivering very frequent services on our, on our rapid routes, um, but the interim service, but it, there are, will be some similarities with the interim service for some of the route buses in terms of timings. Um, we haven't released those yet, but we will be in the next couple of weeks for the community to have a look at. Um, and that will be also provided, of course, to schools ahead of the new school term uh, starting. It also takes into account service changes to that associated with the new temporary bus interchange. It's just finalising completion in Woden as part of the CIT Woden development and the development of the new interchange down there. Um, so it will uh, be a bit different from the uh, interim network, um, but we're, we're hoping this will help us to uh, deliver the services that people expect during a time of, of disruption and provide them with a good option um, because bus, buses uh, and the existing light rail system will be a good option for people looking to try and avoid some of the disruption, take cars off the road and help, help us to reduce congestion during the disruption period. Uh, it includes uh, buses um, being rerouted as well uh, around the that construction zone, so I mentioned we're putting in new signals on the circle which are close to completion, ready for the construction to begin from the 2nd of December. Buses will use that, um, that those signals on Vernon Circle to get down to Constitution Avenue. 
and then uh, turning left onto the eastern side of London Circuit to get into the city interchange and they will stop at the assembly uh, <laughs> for those that are, use that very popular stop. Um, and, and there's also some other um, slight changes as well to um, some of the other uh, routes and a little bit of help there. Some of those, that information's available already. Next generation ticketing. Look, I hope to come to this meeting and uh, announce uh, the, um, the, the, the delivery partner for the new modern flexible ticketing system that we're currently in procurement for. It is in the very final stage and I'm hoping that we'll have an announcement soon about that. It has taken a little bit longer than we expected for that process to um, finalise, but um, I'm told that it's very close and we, we still expect the new ticketing solution for public transport in Canberra to be implemented from next year. Um, so everyone's familiar with the benefits of new ticketing systems in Sydney and, and, and uh, other, other cities around Australia and Queensland has just updated their uh, new public transport ticketing system as well. So we're looking at having much of the same similar functionality, payment by credit card, payment on a mobile phone, um, and uh, as well as having those options available to use a card and those sorts of things as well. Um, so it will be much easier to use public transport once that uh, is brought in as well. Um, and of course, we've had to try and take into account um, some of the latest advice around cyber security as well uh, to make sure that it's properly protected given the current circumstances that we're in uh, nationally that everyone's facing with an uptick in the amount of cyber incidents. Uh, the Canberra, again, the, um, I'm very excited. Um, it's literally, it could be any day now that we actually have our first uh, electric buses arrived, well we expected before the end of the year, ready to start operations next year. They'll be operating from both depots, Tuggerong and uh, Belconnen. Uh, and we're working, uh, of course, to purchase a further 90 uh, on top of that, the procurement's underway uh, for that and it's been underway for a, for a period of time. Um, we've been working closely with Evo Energy on the energy requirements to support the new buses. Um, a lot of people in the community think we just need to buy the buses and start charging them. Well, our depots simply don't have the power. Um, these are very large batteries um, in, in these vehicles and when you have 100 buses in one location, um, it draws a significant uh, amount of um, kilovolt amps from the system. So uh, we've had to um, look at that very closely around the energy requirements. We've got some really good advice. And what we're looking to do is make sure that we not only have Woden Depot um, fully established as a uh, fully electric um, bus depot, but also augment the energy capacity at the other depots as well so that we're not just catering for the hundred, first 100 buses, or first 112 buses, as it may be, uh, but hundreds of buses ahead um, that we know we need to transition to zero emissions um, by 2040 or earlier. Um, so we're doing that work now, um, it's important work, and um, you'll start to see some, some work happening um, there, as well as, of course, the actual installation within the fence, within the depot itself, of the actual, uh, the actual charges themselves, the DC charges. Um, the transport strategy we're continuing to implement, so the active travel plan uh, draft um, has been out for consultation. I think that's been a really uh, useful piece of work. I think it's going to be a really important piece of work, as I mentioned, protected intersections. That's one example. Another example of a hypothetical intersection in Canberra, um, an arterial to arterial, but we've got some other um, other designs that will be released soon as part of a best practice design guide for uh, streets and intersections in Canberra. That will be translated into a municipal infrastructure standard, so any intersection that we upgrade will take those into account um, in design, and it will literally reshape the way that Canberra looks and feels and, um, and hopefully will support safer streets, particularly for walking and cycling. So, Really excited about that piece of work, and we'll be doing some cons further consultation on that. Um, and also keen to hear from PTCBR, particularly about how it um, caters for public transport as well. Um, you can see some buses in there, but appreciate that it doesn't have a dedicated bus bus lane in, in there, which I'm sure you'd be asking for. Uh, and, and of course, um, does of course exist on some of our existing streets. Um, 
Next slide. Let's. So we're doing some work on the future of light rail network as well. Um, we've seen in the last couple of weeks the Fishwick uh, business community put out their proposal uh, to run a light rail line down the existing heavy, heavy rail uh, line um, nearby, to, nearby to Canberra Avenue uh, running through to Fishwick and then they've also suggested it should loop around and, and come back um, by the airport uh, on Moorshead Drive. Um, where, of course, we welcome their enthusiasm for, for light rail and what it can do to rejuvenate, um, uh, rejuvenate the city and particularly support um, business. I think it's really exciting to see those sorts of proposals being put forward. We're certainly going to take that into consideration as part of a piece of work we're doing to update the light rail network plan, and which is sort of known as the light rail master plan for the future extensions of the line. Um, what I'd say is the Fishwick's, pro Fishwick's proposal was predicated on stage two being built um, because it connects the Canberra Avenue connection connects into stage two um, around State Circle. Um, and so we need to, of course, build that first. Um, but they've got some interesting, um, I think, interesting proposals to put forward. Transport for New South Wales has also been doing some consultation about uh, public transport in uh, around the Queanbeyan uh, region as well. Um, where the issue of like a future light rail connection has come up, which we find um, very interesting, and so we'll be taking that into account uh, as well as we continue this work, which is really to make sure that we've um, we've got some of the um, future planning for the city mapped out, so that we can preserve the corridors where future lines will run, and that's particularly important when it comes to the middle of the CBD, where there's this extensive amount of development happening. Um, and we know that at some point the stage three line from Belconnen will, will have to cross over and connect through the city, cross over the existing light rail line and connect through the city. And we need to just make sure that we're preserving those corridors so that um, development doesn't happen on a future line. Uh, and so that we've got that there um, ready to go when we, when we can um, start future work on, on stage three in terms of design and, and construction and then on, on future routes as well. So that works underway and keen to hear PTCBR's view about what the what the priorities are there and what, what sorts of things that we should be considering uh, as we do that work uh, going forward. So look, I'll leave it there. There's a lot covered there and there's probably a whole bunch more that we could um, talk about in, in the public transport space, how we get more people back onto public transport. Um, being a big one, I know we had a sort of forum about that uh, earlier on in the year, and we continue to try and uh, make sure we attract more people back into public transport going into the new year. That's certain, you'll certainly see a lot of communication from government about the benefits of using public transport to try and attract people back on as we kind of move out of the, the COVID period. Uh, hopefully, when people feel a little bit safer uh, to use um, public transport. So thank you for the opportunity. I'm happy to answer any questions. We've got, of course, um, Ash Kahith and, and the team here from Major Projects Canberra as well who can take any of the uh, more detailed technical questions which I um, often get from this group, I have to say. Mm -hmm. uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of interest. Thank you very much, Minister. I've got a roaming mic this evening, so um, obviously if you have a question, pop up your hand, Murray will hand you the microphone and um, ask the question away. I'm happy to start. Well, thank you, Minister. Um, there's a lot in that presentation. Um, some news in there, I suspect, but we're the first in the public to hear it. So a lot of things to mull over um, process from our organisation's view. My question relates to how long it's taken from the completion of stage one to really get work underway for stage two. So obviously, light rail stage one was essentially you know, brought to the public's attention in the 2012 election, um, was voted on at the 2016 election, and was delivered by the 2020 ACT election. Stage two has taken a little bit longer than that. Um, there's been all sorts of debate around you know, time frames and this and that and the other. Obviously, there have been some I mean, incidents along the way in terms of approvals and overlapping approval responsibilities and whatnot. I guess my question is, is twofold. Why has it taken so long? 
And is it likely that this length of time between different stages and then the completion of those stages is likely to continue for stages beyond just stage two? The stage one was a much simpler project in, in so many uh, different ways. And um, we sort of hit, hit a sweet spot in the um, infrastructure pipeline where there wasn't a whole lot of uh, major infrastructure work going on in Australia in relation to particularly rail systems at the time. We got a really good price, it came in under budget, uh, it was delivered pretty much on time, uh, and it's delivered a great outcome. Uh, things changed um, after that. We had a global pandemic, uh, and um, the infrastructure market changed. We've got a massive pipeline of infrastructure work that's happening uh, right across Australia. There are light rail systems that have been built in a uh, huge number of cities, um, including Parramatta, um, stage one, stage, stage two, um, and, and beyond, and, and future extensions in the Gold Coast and so forth, plus all of the other civil infrastructure projects that these T1 companies, um, that these T1 companies are involved with. So um, that we were very clear before the last election that we weren't going to sign contracts on stage 2A uh, during that period of instability at a time when uh, the cash factory in Spain was literally closed due to COVID-19 and because we wanted to get the best outcome for the territory in terms of value for money for the project. Um, so we've been, we didn't stop work, we continued the work that we needed to do with the planning approvals. Um, there's been a change of government and let me tell you that has made a massive difference um, both in terms of getting this through the planning process and from an NCA point of view, there have been um, sticking points that um, simply melted away as a result of that change. Um, in terms of the design uh, of the stage two alignment um, and that has made a massive difference together with one of the milestones that I didn't mention, which was of course getting some extra funding from the Commonwealth, now 214 million, delivery on federal labor's 2019 election commitment to uh, invest $200 million in the project. So we've got now funding that takes into account the extra costs and the cost escalation has occurred during this period as well uh, for a lot of the components of the project. Um, we're in an inflationary period, that's the reality of it. Everything is going up in price, unfortunately, except for electricity in Canberra. Um, <laughs> thought I'd mention that. Um, but um, we know that this is a complex uh, project to, to design plan and cure, stage 2B is going to be a, a multiple of that. Um, and so um, I realise that people are very keen to see this um, delivered. Well, work has started. Work is now happening. It will be very real for everyone in the city, uh, particularly from the 2nd of December, um, that work has started on uh, building light rail to Woburn. Um, and we will do uh, everything that we can to try and uh, progress with 2B once we've, um, we've changed focus from 2A, once we've got it um, procured. Um, and we'll be looking at what the opportunities are as well on 2B to start early. We've already started building uh, the new interchange with the light rail stop at the other end of the alignment in Woden, the interchange. We'll look at what the opportunities are to do some of the early works, which typically involves potential utility removal out of the alignment so that when we are ready to start work we can just get on and actually build the track. Uh, we'll look at what opportunities there are to do some of the work on some of the intersections as well along the alignment um, and with a view to try and get getting started on elements of this project um, that aren't subject to some of those complex approvals that I previously went through. So um, yes, it's going to take um, perhaps longer than people thought for 2B, uh, but it will be delivered, we expect, this decade. Uh, and we expect um, that light rail stage 2A will be completed around that 2026 um, period for operations there. And it's a, you know, it's it's going to, you know, have some benefits, stage 2A. We know it's going to provide important benefits, um, particularly providing access to the university, but the full benefits will arrive when we get it down to Woden. And we're already seeing some of those benefits even before we start construction on 2B with more people wanting to work and live near the future alignment, on, particularly in my town centre where there are just thousands of people uh, moving in. Go with Andrew and then, uh, then Damien. It's Damien first. Oh, me first. Thank you. Yep, I'll wear it. Thanks, Minister. Uh, I just wanted to ask a question 
about what's still our main form of public transport, the bus system, and um, whether we are going to get a new enterprise agreement that will allow us to have a reasonable weekend bus service. Yeah, very good question. Thank you. We're just in the final. Well, the offer's gone out uh, for the uh, for the agreement uh, to the ACT public service, including to our bus drivers um, and also to our mechanics in our um, in our depots. Um, and we've been working closely with them. We've been undertaking through Transport Canberra and negotiating directly undertaking that good faith bargaining. We've been doing an interest-based bargaining process where we've looked at what the outcomes are that both parties, employees and, um, and the employer, uh, Transport Canberra, want to achieve. And one of those uh, outcomes is improved reliability on the weekends. That's been an absolute priority for us in those um, discussions. And we are uh, hopeful of making some improvements through that, um, but we're in that final stage, um, and it's almost up to the point where well, the unions are considering the offer at the moment, um, and uh, and then this is the sort of core offer, uh, and then we'll be finalising the sort of ancillary um, parts, including the action, the, the transport Canberra side of things, very soon. So that has absolutely been a priority for me um, because we need to make sure that we've got that reliability on the weekend and the certainty that will enable us to step up the frequency of services on Saturday afternoons uh, and on Sundays uh, as well. And we're out there recruiting at the moment. Um, it's, uh, I think it's actually an article in today's, in today's paper um, of someone uh, li literally uh, delivering a three-year-old's dream of becoming a bus driver. Um, and the, try, the come and try day is actually tomorrow. If you want to go and drive a bus, um, <laughs> Get out there. Make sure you uh, make sure you tell them in advance that you're coming um, through the Eventbrite system. But we are out there recruiting as well, um, and we're looking forward to uh, looking at what the opportunities are once we conclude the EA negotiations to try and step up services, starting with the um, afternoons on Saturdays. Andrew, thank you. Um, You've explained uh, very well some of the challenges that have faced uh, stage two, uh, light rail as a, as a project. Obviously, the pandemic, the impact of the pandemic, and the impact of the changing environment for um, the infrastructure construction delivery uh, market. Um, with regards to the future light rail uh, network, um, which uh, I am very impressed by the um, by the map that you um, that you showed. Um, I think that's uh, a um, excellent vision for the future of. Uh, um, light rail of the completed light rail network. Um, but I am a little bit concerned by the fact that uh, the government's target is to deliver one stage per decade. Are we factoring in for stages three, four, five, six um, that all of them are going to face the same degree of challenge that, um, that we've seen with stage two? I, I think no. Um, stage two will be forever known as the most complex uh, project in our city's history. Um, the other stages, I think, are less complex, but they still have a range of issues that we need to work through. Stage three, you know, there's still a lot of questions to be answered around the future exact alignment of that uh, route, um, not just in the city, which we're looking at at the moment, but also uh, through the AIS precinct and what, what the future is there. Um, but we do want to progress with our vision of a citywide light rail network and integrate it with bus, buses, which will still play an important role in our city. Um, I think what Australian governments haven't done very well is look at the financing options for some of those. Um, Fishwick Business Association actually were suggesting that we should try and do another uh, another stage in conjunction with stage three, um, using uh, the land sales of the existing heavy rail route and the sort of station, Kingston Station, that are around it to help fund that. A project, which I think is an interesting idea, I think, except for the fact that we don't actually own the <laughs> the heavy rail uh, line um, to be able to get that revenue. Um, but certainly, I think we, we do need to look more. Um, I think work with work with our treasury, um, work with um, the Australian government to come up with new ways of financing this type of infrastructure so that it can be delivered more quickly, and that. Um, you know, tax increment financing and those types of models that have been used in the US to fund uh, infrastructure is, is one way. 
Uh, we don't have the same mechanisms as the US in terms of being able to levy sales tax, which the states can do in the, U United, in, in the US to fund transport infrastructure, which is what they, what they do in, um, in Washington state and, and other states um, around America. Um, so we, we do have to think a little bit more creatively though, because um, at the moment we are not capturing the value, land value uplift associated with the light rail um, stages that we build. Um, so when people complain about their rates going up as a result of you know, being, um, as a result of light rail, um, that's only the case to the to the extent that um, you know we, we rates go up by 3.75 percent a year. The being sort of cap, we've made that policy decision. It's only within that 3.75 percent that we then you know provide a proportionalise um, the, the the amount that people pay on rates based on uh, their land value. So. Um, it's, it's something that we haven't done well and I think we need to look at in the future what the possibility is to potentially better capture um, some of that value and you know, governments can potentially do that by um, you know, selling, selling some of the land uh, on the corridors. We've been doing, of course, a lot of planning work associated with light rail stage two and you might have seen a uh, consultant study which you know, we don't necessarily agree with the recommendations of that study. Um, and I know our various stakeholders around Canberra have put their own views on that one as well, which we certainly would welcome those ideas. But what we have done is put out district planning strategy for consultation as part of the planning review, uh, which identifies in yellow, if you want to go and have a look at those strategies, the potential investigation areas um, for um, potentially for future densification and future uh, future residential. Uh, those are typically located close to shopping centres but also close to those uh, public transport corridors um, and so there are opportunities there certainly have more people living there. Uh, what we haven't done is capture the value of, of that potential development and we've seen that development happen on stage one. I mean it's just incredible um, and we're going to look at that a little bit more closely as well just to see exactly what has been the effect of stage one and it's still going and still development that's yet to happen along that corridor. There's still yet to be thousands of people living in that corridor using stage one, uh, but it has certainly triggered an amount of, um, of rejuvenation that simply would not have happened if light rail had not been built. Um, buses didn't trigger that. Um, and there's a little bit of you know, demand and population growth that's housing demand and population growth that's driving that, but a lot of it was stage one. People wanting to work and live near the light rail stops uh, along the route. So we think that that's some, those same benefits will apply on future stages as well. Excellent. We've got Bill, we've got Mark. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Great presentation. Always good to see the future of my rail. Um, one question is related to the design of stage two. This organisation that recently participated in the Department um, of Infrastructure's review of the disability standards for transport and they're working on a stage two model. Now I'm asking are we going to incorporate the recommendations that are going to come out of that into the design of stage two and future bus stops? Now, for example, um, trying to get the stations all looking the same so partially sighted people don't struggle. Um, gradients, distances, um, transferring between modes minimised. So what we're trying to do is get away from being a city that was eaten by cars. You know, thanks, Chris. Yeah, no, I'm happy to look at those and what we can do to incorporate uh, any standards. We're just about up to the point um, where we've got 100% DEA compliant buses. Um, uh, thankfully, we're getting rid of the old Renault buses, which are the remaining ones that are not accessible. Um, and we're just at the point where um, uh, all of our bus stops should be DBA compliant as well, which has been a massive program over a number of years to upgrade bus stops and make sure they have path connections that are of a certain gradient and so forth. So um, we're almost there on that, and certainly uh, we expect that there'll be further reforms needed. Um, we're also looking at um, some, some work um, which the transport plan is in. in uh, Transport Canberra City Services are doing around a multimodal network plan, which is going to be sort of an operational plan. Um, so that when we're looking at um, 
trying to connect people around the city, we're not just looking at roads, but we're looking at how, how all of the different types of transport uh, connects. Um, and, and so we'll be trying to you know, take that into account there as well. Um, but certainly very interested in that work and what we can do um, at future stages. There are obviously some design constraints that we need to work with when we're designing these things as to whether there should be an island stop or the other types of side-by-side side side stops. Um, um, but certainly what, whatever we can do to make things more accessible is, is good for everyone, not just people with disability or mobility issues. Excellent. One then too. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Minister. Um, I found that um, your, your um, uh, explanation about what's happening with Stage 2B and, and the options being reopened perhaps on the route when, I, when we talk about value capture in Canberra, we always leave this massive hole in the middle that's black. Never appears on your plans, never appears on anybody else's plans. But the parliamentary triangle. Um, you mentioned before this clover lease on the southern end of Commonwealth Avenue Bridge. There's a massive amount of land there. Somebody quoted to me a figure of 40% of the triangle being used for car parking. Um, Obviously, the ACT is not in the position to capture that. Uh, we're now in a potentially once in a century opportunity with the, politi the federal political alignment with a, a second uh, in independent senator here. Yeah. Um, it, it worries me a little bit that you don't seem to have taken the opportunity to reach out to Senator Pocock and really engage with him. And I was very disappointed to see a Twitter exchange between you and Senator Pocock a few weeks ago yep. when you, you um, uh, more or less criticised him for engaging yep. in a Twitter discussion. And my reaction was we're three or four months after he was elected and you haven't briefed him. We have. But, we have. Yeah, well, no, well we that was the implication him. of the, the Twitter exchange. Yeah, no, no, we have briefed him. We briefed him, I think, prior to that exchange. And I have briefed him. I've, I've opened the door. I said, happy to, happy to meet you. And, um, the invitation goes out again. Happy to meet with you. Um, you know, it's important that we meet. It's a, these are matters that are going to come before the Senate potentially for approval, um, and we want his support for this. Um, I'm a bit disappointed that it seems like at the moment anyone that opens his door, a minority group that like Can the Tram or people who are, who have a similar mindset seem to be getting in his ear. Um, and I encourage everyone who supports light rail to continue your advocacy to him and other. Uh, members of Parliament about the importance of light rail for our city and providing a mass transit system um, for our city. Um, we expect um, that in the next couple of weeks the Canberra Liberals will announce that not only that they don't support stage two of light rail, um, breaking their election promise, but also that they will announce that they, they will instead build a trackless tram, um, probably down south and potentially elsewhere. Um, <coughs> Adding a third mode of trans transport to Canberra with all of the interchange penalties that that means, and and there will be a big discussion uh, about what the future is around public transport in Canberra. We're going to need people to advocate uh, for why we need a single mass transit line connecting north and south, uh, with all of the benefits that it will provide in terms of public transport benefits, but also city shaping benefits that uh, buses simply haven't provided. Uh, in our city, uh, and that's what trackless trams are. They're effectively trackless buses. Um, we've already got articulated buses that run to Woden, uh, and we've seen that in other cities, um, that it often means that they require the same level of infrastructure investment to get the same operational outcomes. So many of the same costs will apply, with, of course, the tracks making up a very small component of the overall uh, price of a project. So there's going to be a furious debate that's going to happen in this city about light rail. And this group has always stood up for um, supporting uh, light rail and better public transport system in, in this city at previous elections. And I suspect we'll be going into a fourth election where this will be the uh, major issue um, that will be discussed amongst um, others. Um, and certainly uh, welcome your engagement in that. But we'll engage with everyone, independents. Um, we'll be talking with everyone that we can about the benefits of this project. Um, and a, to be honest, a, a fight like that, a, a political discussion, um, is an opportunity to talk with the community about the benefits of why we're doing stage one. We haven't actually had that opportunity over the last um, couple of years. So we're looking, I'm actually looking forward to having that 
um, genuine debate with, with members to prove our point about why this matters. All right, got one more question. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, um, I'm very pleased to see that by the end of this decade on the architecture trend at work, um, or more important to the National Library and so on. Um, my questions might sound a bit trivial, but um, trees and, and bikeways, um, I'd like to encourage uh, building and planting I mean, of in deciduous trees, yep. voila, uh, which actually really provide shade and then in the this, in this winter provide sun and warmth. Um, and with bike paths, I was really taken by the paths they have in Melbourne CBD. The bike path is on the same level as the road, but separated with concrete strips, not like we have at West London, where the bike path goes up and down, and uh, cyclists hate uh, any change in level sort of thing. So that, that's my two suggestions. Yeah, that's a good. It's it's a good one. There'll be um, sort of more of those paths with the with the separate the protected paths, which is the separation of concrete, but at the same level. In certain other sections, there will need to be a change of level, and one of those is actually on the western side of London Circuit, um, because um, we because of the uh, very skinny width of the street, we do need to actually put, um, put cyclists back up onto the median with the pedestrians for just a short period. Um, there's not enough room to have a dedicated cycle um, cycle route there, and then we'll transition back onto the dedicated cycle route. So we're doing the best we can to try and design that, and Pedal Power's certainly been part of the discussions as well around the design um, through, right through to make sure we get that outcome. Uh, and there'll be further opportunities soon with the new stuff city plan, um, which will be coming out, which will also have a design guide for the city around some of these elements that are always associated with light rail. Take your point on the deciduous trees. Um, it will make a change of trees. Some of the pest species that were in the corridor will have to be removed or replaced with different types. But most most of the deciduous, there are some uh, mixed natives as well, eucalypts. Um, and that's just based on some of the early design. I don't know whether you want to comment on that, Ash, on these specific species and um, the landscape plan for the Commonwealth. Sure. So certainly, in terms of um, in terms of the uh, species along the corridor for two A, uh, it responds to the areas. So there are, there will be different plantings depending where you go. So um, you saw the uh, the uh, steep peak of Northbourne Place. Um, and then as you move around London Circuit, there, there are different species um, that are sympathetic to the area. Uh, again, this is all going to be going through the DA and works approval uh, process. And then moving on to the Commonwealth Avenue, um, we're very much in the hands of the NCA um, and working through a, um, a, uniform, uh, a uniform and well-structured landscape master plan that, got, that not only responds in 2A being the northern side, but also in the southern side as well. Um, we, there are a number of plantings already there and the plantings that we will, we will be putting in, uh, including putting trees in the median. Um, and what we need to be very careful of doing there is uh, in between light rail tracks, um, there's a limit to which species we can actually plant there. Um, so, so we are constrained by some of those species, certainly what we're working through. It's a better terrain in Cyprus, I think, is the, the, the pencil pencil fine type. Uh, yeah. you, you want yeah. them very tall and, yeah. and away, yes. Oh, oh. No, they're the pest species that oh. I was referring to, yeah, yeah, of course, the uh, fluff and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. All right, we've got one last question from Murray. Oh. So there's an alternative species to the to the poplar which yeah. has a similar shape. With that and it has and you'll be the final one. So one and then Murray's the last one. Well, thanks, Minister, for what you've told us so far. Um, I have a, a lot of um, misgivings about um, stage two. Um, not because I'm not an enthusiast, um, but because because I am, I suppose. And I'm in, I'll focus the my, my question on what I consider to be Canberra's um, bus success story 
namely the, the rapid surface between the city and road and, and Tuggeranong. Um, and the attention that that from time to time does uh, attract in the newspaper, and it, and it did only a couple of days ago in fact, um, the, the planned rail route of course has, is longer, has more stops, and um, has the great benefit of course of um, ha having a, catch a, a, a reasonable catchment, but it still raises the question um, how are we going to cope with the odious comparison with the very nifty trip between Woden and the city that's provided by the buses. Now, some, there are some possible um, uh, avenues for improvement. Um, I think, unfortunately, like so many aspects of this, um, things that this, there are things that are just done deals. But number one, the choice of rolling stock. Um, the CAF trams have a top speed of 70 kilometres an hour. Um, certainly you wouldn't want to run them any faster um, with the, um, um, under, uh, you know, the, the, with their running gear, with the, the relatively short um, um, wheelbase of, of the, um, of the casts, of, of the of the image of portions. Um, another, another eight ball that, that behind is this plan to load them up with battery storage for, for wire sweeps. Uh, wire-free operation. Yep. Now, is wire-free operation really a done deal? Uh, because if we look at what we've got in Northbourne Avenue and out to, to Gungala, we've got um, overhead line construction that's exemplary um, compared with what's done in many cities, particularly in the US. Yep. It's just splendid. Uh, um, can that be revisited? Uh, well, sorry. And then next, and then finally, <laughs> and, and, if the, and if the trams can't make the, the trip in, in anything like the speed that the buses get, is there going to be a parallel express bus service? Yeah, there's a few questions there. So, yeah, we can't hang the lines off buildings like they do in the US and others to run itinerary buses and, and light rail. Um, so, yeah, the poles are needed, um, and they will be needed on 2B as well, uh, round about Hoken Circle, uh, Hoken Circuit um, South. Um, that'll, that'll be the sort of first stop that they connect or back on to Y3 running down Adelaide Avenue. The new technology uh, that's coming, that's been developed on, on modern energy systems has got a lot better over recent years. Um, so uh, we, we expect the performance to be to be good. Um, through, it's always, the light rail would order, have, always have to run a little bit slower through the parliamentary triangle. It's just the reality of going through that area. Um, but certainly it is a different system to the current bus services the rapid bus services that run um, down and that down to load and it, it will stop um, in places that those services have never been able to stop. Um, there is literally no stop between South Curtain and Albert Hall at the moment for all those rapid services. So every suburb of Hughes, Rester Curtain uh, and Deakin Yarralumla, uh, as well as you know areas around um, Barton and Forest, and there, they don't have access to those rapid stops. And um, and that means that they don't have, they don't enjoy any of the public transport benefits that come come with that. Um, so this will stop, and I don't think we really could have built stage two of light rail and completely not stop through that area. Oh, no, no, we we that. just would never have got away with it. Oh, um, no, the stop, know, stops are fine. Yeah. It's just getting between them. Yeah, and look, the stops add time. There's no doubt about that. But it's 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 still it's comparable to stage one in terms of the, the time that it runs, almost similar you know, distance. Um, and so we think it will run in the same way and have the same benefits that we've seen on, on stage one there. Um, and we couldn't have run it down to Woden without going through the parliamentary triangle to get through that employment hub, which is so critical and which so many people want to access, not just from Woden, but don't think we, and we need to sell this benefit of, of the extension of stage one. It is an extension of stage one. All of the people on the north, north side will be using this to get, get south of the lake, to get down to that employment hub in in Barton to get down to the employment hub in Deakin and Woden. So um, we have to make sure that we capture those public transport benefits um, along the route. Um, and yes, of course, there'll be people that have nostalgia for the, for the, the old buses. We haven't got to the point where we've looked at the integrated bus plan. We'll do that 
closer to the time um, that operations start for stage 2B um, and we'll be looking closely at what the opportunities are but I can I do expect and this is you know saying it now it's several years ahead of time that you know buses will still rapid buses will still run from Western Creek and Longlo uh, onto from the Cotter Road uh, onto Adelaide Avenue and through to the city so there still will be you know, some bus services there, and I'm sure that there'll be direct bus services from Lanyard straight through the city on the Monero and, and, and on the Tokong Parkway as well, taking different routes that get people more directly and more quickly into the city than, than they would connecting with light rail and motor. Um, so there'll be opportunities, I think, particularly with the extra buses that are freed up from building light rail stage two, to put on more routes, uh, put on more frequency on, onto some of those other routes from further flung locations but um, Tokong residents will benefit from stage 2 of light rail as well when they connect with it and um, being able to access some of those locations they haven't been able to access before on the, on the rapid bus system so um, it will be running wire free um, I think that's a that's an ob it's just an absolute requirement of the NCA that they've made for us and we that's not gonna I don't think that one's gonna change some other things have changed but um, so that, that is going to happen. Um, we've obviously made the order and the retrofitting will be happening over, over the next four years now. Yep. But on future I'm routes, there's opportunities for other rolling stock, like you've suggested. We that certainly haven't rolled, that, but haven't rolled that out. And then there's always potential of using other ro rolling stock on, on, the, on this alignment as well down the track if we ever decide to make that decision or if CAP you know, doesn't want to supply the next tranche of trams or whatever. Yep. All right. Final question. Yes, I did also want to state, <coughs> for those of you who don't know the recent um, bus driver recruitment story you mentioned before, is of a friend of the channel, Brock Inman. Um, yes, he's very passionate about buses, I can attest to that. I did want to ask, with, I suppose it's going to be called Network 23, I was wondering if there's going to be public consultation provided on that? So we, we constantly um, take feedback um, throughout the year and make updates to the network and timetable. Um, we've made, uh, we get that from school communities, um, particularly around bell time changes, which happen every year that we have to adjust our buses uh, timetables to. We get it from the broader community coming through to be directly ministerials through, the, um, through to Transport Canberra, directly through their customer feedback mechanisms. And that is then fed into uh, what we need to do as well as uh, looking a bit more strategically about you know, what improvements we need to make. So some of the changes, for example, we've heard it very loud and clear from Fraser residents that they do not want that many buses stopping at the layover in Fraser. So we are making some adjustments to the network to uh, not have as many um, routes stop, as many, um, as many shifts stopping there for a layover. They will, they will um, continue on to other parts, they'll still drop people at Fraser. So we're making those changes. We're putting in buses into Lawson for the first time now that the roundabout is complete there to enable them to get in and out, um, which is an extension of the existing um, bus route um, there. So we're, we're making those changes in incrementally, but um, I think certainly there's future opportunities to look at improvements there as the city grows in the, particularly in the new areas. And of course, with Longwell as well, which Ryan's been talking to us about what happens when we have the new commercial centre and the new Long Below 3 development in the future. Well, thank you, Chris. I wanted to thank you for fielding all our questions today. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I propose that we um, move on to PDCBR's AGM for 2022 and we'll commence proceedings with the Chair's report. The Chair, of course, being myself, will the report. Hello. So, um, look, just want to give a quick overview of our activities this past year because it has been incredibly busy. Um, some of them were actually touched on by the Minister over the course of his presentation, but I'll come back to our involvement in those activities as well. So the first big thing is, you might recall in our last meeting last year, we um, had the NCA and major projects come talk to us about raising London Circuit. Um, it was a trying to herd a bunch of cats into that virtual room. Um, but in the end, we had a, a great presentation and enables, enabled us to get a good idea of where we could add value to that process. So our submission called for additional bus stops um, and bus priority measures around the intersection. Um, and obviously investigating further priority measures, uh, temporary or, or permanent, depending on what worked best, um, if bus uh, performance did deteriorate significantly uh, over the course of the construction period. And we also called for the removal of elements which appear to be designed uh, to add unnecessary friction to pedestrian movements across Commonwealth Avenue and the construction of additional pedestrian crossings across Vernon Circle to City Hill. And uh, in the end, we were successful on one of those things. Um, we had um, the construction of a new pedestrian crossing, a new footpath around City Hill at the uh, intersection of the Edinburgh Avenue extension, providing a safe pedestrian um, connection from Edinburgh Avenue to Constitution Avenue around City Hill. And uh, as has been discussed today by the Minister, uh, that there is still a bit of work to be done, a bit of design refinement to be undertaken on raising London Circuit as part of the light rail stage 2A works approval. So uh, we'll use that as another opportunity to get some of our other recommendations actioned as well. Uh, in March, we provided some feedback on the Whitlam Local Centre consultation that was run by the Suburban Land Agency. And our submission asked for some you know, pretty important things, a pedestrian focused local centre uh, with shops close and visible to nearby bus stops and parking provided by means other than large bulk surface arrangements. So be a bit clever about where it goes, don't just slap a big square of bitumen out the front and call the door. Um, and the resulting design and place brief that was produced by the SLA, which the tenderers for the site will have to use it as um, informing their response, does actually feature a lot of those things. Uh, we're still waiting to get a bit more detail about how it integrates with the bus stops there, but that's partially because the roads actually aren't finished yet, so we won't know what the bus stop arrangements are um, until that fencing comes down and we get a better idea. But the um, signs on that one are positive as well. Uh, and also, as the Minister mentioned, uh, we provided a submission to the Queen Vienna Region Integrated Transport Plan. Uh, and as people might have experienced, the current bus situation in Queen Vienna isn't necessarily satisfactory. Um, and in many respects, a few steps behind what's on offer on this side of the border. And while a lot of people point towards the rightful problem that there is very poor integration between Queanbeyan bus services and those offered over in the ACT, um, obviously some basic stuff like more frequent services within Queanbeyan, two destinations Queanbeyanites want to go to in their own side of town, are equally important. And so the integrated transport plan still is under development. A you know, consultation report was published. Uh, and, and yeah, as the Minister said, the extension of light rail to Queenby and ranked highly as a request among respondents to that survey. So we hope our feedback will help inform the non-light rail aspects of that particular report as well. Good frequent buses are something you can do overnight with enough drivers um, and obviously as people might have seen, they're very keen to get drivers starting over on that side of the border, in fact starting immediately. So we're hoping that the integrated transport strategy for our over the border neighbours um, delivers that outcome and gets some great local uh, rapid bus services. Uh, in May, we provided a, um, a budget submission uh, to the ACT government's budget consultation process. Uh, and most of our items in that one were just calls for the ACT government to deliver what they promised in previous budgets. Because if you read the budget documents, you get a lot of reprofiling, especially in Transport Canberra, where basically what happens is they have the money, they want to spend it, but they didn't get around to doing it. So it gets moved into next year. And I think a really good example of this is the Woden bus interchange, where a, uh, it's been on the books, it's been on the plans for long, but it's been on the budget book since 2016. The contract to deliver it was signed in 2018, and works to build it only started this month. 
So it's for this reason that we asked for, in one of our more publicised aspects, the um, call to invest more in project delivery capabilities. It's all well and good to sign contracts and have great plans, but if you can't actually deliver on the ground, those plans don't mean a great deal. And one other thing we um, put in for is the, um, is this, uh, hold on, wrong slide. Here we go. Uh, we provide a submission to the ACD government's review of flexible transport, which we compile based on excellent feedback provided by our membership. And I would like to provide a special shout out to PDCBR member Roger Shelton for <coughs> providing his first hand experience with how the system currently operates. And our submission noted that the objective of flexible transport and the system should be to provide mobility to those who cannot access the standard public transport network and that the current system does not meet that objective. So the submission called for a provision of a dedicated fleet of vehicles as opposed to just calling on community buses and better integration with the current ticketing and new ticketing system, I should say, that was almost announced this evening. We almost had more uh, exclusives in this meeting and I apologise for not pushing it as far as possible to the end of this month. But Nevertheless, an announcement pending, um, and it is important that as part of that flexible bus service be considered as part of that new system. So we're hoping you'll get some good outcomes there as well. Um, and as Bill alluded to earlier, we also provided a, um, a submission to the Commonwealth Department of Infrastructure's um, second stage reform to the Disability Standards and Accessible Public Transport 2002. And our submission supported the department's focus on uniformity of design, and the end-to-end -end travel experience. So not just being on the bus, but what happens when you get off the bus and when you get on the bus. Those are equally important in every transport journey, as every person who captures a bus or light rail is an active transport user. And you cannot exclude those parts of the transport system from your consideration as to whether it is an accessible system. And so we hope that the uh, department's approach will help to identify and resolve issues that limit the routine use of public transport by Australians with a disability, and as part of the consultation on stage two, as Bill mentioned, uh, we will be calling on the ACT government to incorporate those reforms into the design, development and delivery of the project, as well as other planned improvements to public transport in the ACT. The um, other big thing that happened this year was, as once again Mr. Steele alluded to, the draft active travel plan. So we put in a submission to that, we got a bit of coverage. Um, not that it was particularly controversial, but you know, obviously getting your, your you know stuff out there. Um, obviously, there's everyone will find something to complain about. But we thought we put in a pretty sensible submission, and it was just calling for the prioritisation of local active travel routes on our collective roads over those longer distance linear routes. So our view is, it's easy to get someone to walk or ride one or two kilometres to the shops in the local school, then perhaps the ten or so kilometres it might take for them to ride to work. The submission, of course, also called for better integration between active transport and public transport. And uh, as alluded to, this, pick, this did get picked up by a number of local media outlets and uh, instigated a great many interesting comments, um, which is a testament to our organisation's ability to stimulate the local discourse on a wide range of transport issues. And speaking of um, interesting things in the Riot Act, uh, you may have seen some of the Pocock's um, interesting comments on Block Rail Stage 2 um, in September. And uh, thanks to our fantastic friends at Greater Canberra, we uh, were able to secure a meeting with David Pocock, I believe it was that week, in fact, Friday, um, which was a fantastic opportunity, and we greatly appreciated the Senator's um, uh, taking time out of his, as we've all seen in the news recently, very busy schedule, um, to listen to our thoughts on the matter. And it was very productive. It was a really, really good discussion. Uh, we heard David's interest in building a better Canberra. And we were actually able to correct a number of misconceptions around light rail and purported alternatives uh, by pro providing a like-for-like -like cost breakdown on a per kilometre basis. So we were able to demonstrate using actual evidence as opposed to mythical thinking that <laughs> there are that regardless of what some particular informed commentary might say, some of which may or may not be coming out of a major political party in the ACT soon, there is no readily apparent cost advantage. It just does not exist. So we'll obviously be using some of these figures that were developed for that particular briefing more widely over the coming years. And uh, obviously we've seen that with Senator Senator Pocock's more enthusiastic reception of the Fishwick light rail line, perhaps we may have actually um, changed his thinking on this one. So once again, thank you so much to Greater Canberra for using their connections to get us all in the room, um, and also to Senator for taking time. He's a very busy man, 
Um, he's also a very important man and a very um, powerful man in the context of what the federal government may or may not want to get passed in the various houses of parliament and concessions he may, not get, may or may not be able to extract to deliver on his election promises. We um, also provided a submission to the estate development application at Derry Road, which is that wonderful little precinct out by Fishwick, just on the other side of the Monero Highway. Now this location is currently served by a single road in and out, and um, obviously the very least we would like to see the current bus loop 56, which is shown here in the current land, just does a little loop around the roundabout. Uh, we want to give it the opportunity to actually go into the precinct and provide a public transport stop, which is closer to where the actual you know, action is going to be in that precinct. Um, but obviously it's a bit of a magical mystery to a bus, the 56. It goes everywhere and nowhere particularly quickly. In the longer term, we obviously would like to see a uh, more substantial uh, transport solution considered for Fishwick in serving this precinct. And of course, enter at a very convenient opportunity the Fishwick Business Association's Eastwick Green Line proposal, which was announced last week to great fanfare. And of course, as it has been discussed in our various media outlets, this uh, proposal does involve repurposing the existing heavy rail corridor that runs through Fishwick uh, to feature an extension of Canberra's light rail network new residential development and an active travel corridor. So we actually met with the um, Fishwood Business Association earlier this year when they wanted to talk about it in high level terms. We saw some of what they provided. It was great to see their enthusiasm. Um, and we really welcome this sort of proactive um, involvement from the business community in planning for development that features active and public transport as a focus. Uh, we did provide some verbal advice um, just in terms of, of things which might be well received and things that might not be. Um, obviously, we'll then continue to uh, provide our feedback on the proposal um, if it progresses beyond this stage, and even if it doesn't, we'll provide our views on what the Fishwick Business Association released um, and how it relates to it, making sure that it meets Canberra's metropolitan transport needs, and as well as the, um, the needs of the Fishwick area and its associated businesses. And speaking of, um, of means of communication, how good is PTCBR's new website? <laughs> No, no, I was going to say, I love it so much. No, look, and it is a fantastic piece of work that was and is only possible thanks to the fantastic folks at Transit Graphics. It is the brainchild of our secretary, Matt Bailey, um, and we owe an incalculable debt uh, to Transit Graphics, Arias and John Makita, who very generously donated their time and resources to making this fantastic website happen. And not only does it have an incredibly bold new look, and I think it's been described as the best transport advocacy website on the internet, and so far I can't find any evidence to disprove that statement, um, we have a fantastic new membership payment system, which allows you to sign up and pay for your membership fees online. And I know a lot of you already have, we've had a fantastic response to this new form, and we obviously greatly appreciate the support of all of our existing members and those who are also joining us for the first time. We are a member-driven organisation, and all the membership fees go towards administration expenses involved in just keeping us running, hosting meetings like this, getting in the room with you know, senators, having discussions with organisations responsible for planning for these things. And as you've seen today, we've got some pretty good scoops on some really major infrastructure projects in the ACT. So I like to think that the membership fees, just for getting those outcomes and letting people have that opportunity to ask questions of the minister, you know, without the, that filter of the assembly or other things is worth it. Um, and obviously, in addition to supporting us and the work we do, members do get access to events, newsletters, and our new PTCBR Members Forum on Facebook. Uh, and in, in time, we will also add members-only content to our website. And if you haven't already paid your 2022-23 membership fees, head over to the website now, just because, not just because of this, it's also really fun to navigate. Again, fantastic work to Matt for putting that together. Um, and you set yourself up an account, because there's some really exciting stuff coming up. And um, yes, in what may yet prove to be a massive but short-lived success, uh, PTCBR have, <laughs> again thanks to the work of our fantastic secretary, Matt, uh, reactivated our Twitter account. And this has enabled us to reach new audiences and extend the reach of our public transport advocacy. So make sure you head over, quick, uh, while it's still there, uh, to give us a follow and help spread the good word of public transport advocacy in Canberra. And so, um, it has been a big year. It's been a big year of submissions and a lot of outward-facing renewal here at the Public Transport Association of Canberra. So what does the year ahead hold for our organisation? Well, there's one thing that we know for sure, and that's that we'll see some movement on the bus network. 
early next year. Um, and obviously that partially involves the new bus network timetables starting in term one. And we will obviously be very keen to know what the change that has in store, not just for whether it you know, starts the restoration of those weekend services, which is long overdue. We've still got the two hourly weekend services in some cases, and that is not acceptable. Um, but also we came to know how exactly some of those frequency changes will be modified to account for the disruption on Common North Avenue. If you this congestion, it delays the buses, you need more buses to run, it's going to be running tight. My understanding is they will be having all hands on deck for the two year construction period for RLC. So we'll watch with interest to see how those services are distributed um, and making sure that we're still able to get good public transport outcomes throughout the construction phase. And um, of course on that construction phase, there is the upcoming works approval for light rail stage 2A. Um, this has been a long time coming. And we'll obviously be putting in a submission, but I really would encourage everyone here to also pop your word in and have a say. Even if it's a single sentence, just saying you support the outcomes. It was interesting to hear the Minister allude to the fact that the NCA requested that the act protective active travel infrastructure be removed from raising London circuit process. Quite frankly, I think that's appalling. I'm not quite sure why that was done, but for goodness sake, if you think it's a good idea to have protected infrastructure for pedestrians and cyclists around major intersections, say so. When the opportunity arises, have your say, make your voice heard, because you can be sure there'll be plenty of people who are not quite as far-sighted and have different priorities, who aren't necessarily um, consistent with the values we hold here at PTCBR, who will be more than happy to put their, their, their two pence in for it. So well, it's obviously important for the National Capital Authority to know that there is public support for light rail and there is public support for good active travel infrastructure to get people to those stops. Um, and obviously there is the light rail network plan refresh as the Minister alluded to as well. Um, and obviously as touched on and as Transport Canberra have relayed to us, the focus is not on changing these routes. It's largely about just providing more details about those routes. Uh, and obviously the how it interacts in the city centre aspect of things is quite important. Um, and obviously there's multiple lines that do intersect in the city centre and we want to make sure that all of those lines are considered um, as part of that light rail network plan refresh. So the contract is, I understand, worth less than 100 grand. Um, so we're not expecting too many detailed technical studies, um, you know, involving soil sampling and, and vast engineering diagrams. Um, but the, the hope is with this piece of work, we can avoid the sort of delivery gaps we've seen between stages one and stages two. It was a product of not enough planning having been done in the lead up to stage two. Um, and we're hoping that this piece of work, by focusing on those complicated areas, the areas where contention is likely to be highest, that we can avoid the sort of gaps we've seen between stages one and two with stages two and three. It's great to hear that we've got 2B in this decade. Let's see if we can't get stage three done before the midway point of next decade. Let's get it done and let's make sure that we don't have those gaps. And um, I would now like to move that this long rambling chair's report of mine be accepted. I second. Excellent, second. Fantastic. Um, can I get a show of hands for the adoption of our chair's report? Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, we are, we're missing our treasurer this evening, aren't we? Mark Loney. Yeah. Yeah. That's unfortunate. I was wondering about that. Excellent. Uh, Matt, would you be able to step in? Yes. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'm now going to ask our secretary, Matt Bailey, to step in on behalf of our treasurer, Mark Loney, to give the 2022 treasurer's report for the Public Transport Association. Can Canberra. we just wait? Um, Bill, we might just bring that up on the laptop. Just yep. the biggest, if that's okay. Let's do it. You got it. Just give me two minutes. That's all right. So how good is there's a lot of scoops we got in that presentation from the minister. There's a lot of stuff that I've never heard of before. Murray, you had something to say? No. Oh, okay, yes, good. absolutely. Notice on one of those slides, that Cabinet in confidence. Yes. <laughs> you that? There's nothing Cabinet in confidence about a room we've known since 2018. That's what that was using. I was going to say, Cabinet makes its decision slowly by the sounds of things, so it's still being considered. But it is, it is really interesting to see that the Barton Dog Link is being opened up as a possibility for Stage 2. Now, there is no doubt going to be a lot of discussion over the merits of that particular approach. 
Um, the Minister was honest and did note that, of course, it will add time between Wollongong and the city. The re like, regardless of whether it's technically more feasible or cheaper or faster or what have you, we do need to get the best outcome. Like, this is not a project that we can afford to cut corners on. So, obviously, we want to make sure that we can deliver light rail to Woden. We want to make sure we're delivering light rail to Woden in the best possible way to get value for money. But we also need to make sure that we're not making compromises along the way um, that could jeopardise the, the broader integrity of the network. And, of course, the longer it takes to get from one point to another, as you start to add extensions to that line, it starts to have consequences. And certainly, I appreciate discussion we've had raised this evening regarding um, stage uh, two and whether or not we're changing um, the bus network to accommodate the in inclusion of light rail to Wogan. Obviously one of the most significant benefits of light rail stage two is reallocate those bus kilometres. You know, there's a lot of buses that currently traverse between Woden and the city. Um, it's over, I did the calculations myself, it's about 500 bus kilometres per hour. Like, we, we've got a situation right now where there are service places in Canberra that aren't particularly well serviced. And honestly, the first priority should be reallocating those bus service kilometres to parts of Canberra that aren't well serviced by public transport at the moment. Bill. Ryan, I don't think we emphasise enough in this whole conversation about travel time from Woden into the city about the door-to-door -door comparison. Now, this evening, coming in here, I think Woden, um, what's his name? Murray, up at Western Creek. Sadly, I couldn't get the R7 today because they had a pile of junk green with me. It took us 20 minutes to get here. It took us a further 40 minutes to find somewhere to store the car before we can unload it. I've been looking out the window while I've been thinking of wires back here. <clears throat> We're in a constant traffic jam, people driving round and round and round. We don't emphasise that enough. What the people arguing against journey times argue is it takes them five minutes or ten minutes to get to where they store their car. They don't talk about how long they take, how long they take to hunt to find the spot. That's a term they use as A&U. You buy a license to hunt when you get a parking voucher. And then they don't talk about how long it takes to get from where they deposit their car for the day and pay out the 10 or 20 bucks or whatever they do to the pleasure of having minded. It's all got to be brought in the mix. And I think the government has not been very good at bringing the comparison together. And we also need to get better ourselves in communicating and saying, yeah, look, what about all the other downtime we have? No, look, I mean, you get a head of disagreement from me, but cars suck. Like, we, all, we all rely on for a variety of means, but as, look, as someone who catches the bus to and from work five days a week, it is quicker on every, every measure, not just in terms of parking and waiting, but obviously just even getting out of, of where I live at that particular time of day. It's, um, there is some fantastic bus priority infrastructure in the long road. Um, one of the things I'm keen on, on pursuing is obviously light rail is rolled out, is making sure that we are emphasising the importance of bus priority measures. It is a shame that with stage uh, 2A that there was a brief window of time where there was a bus turn lane um, on Commonwealth Avenue which would have provided bus priority um, in a particularly um, tight point in town. Uh, that hasn't made it to the final version. So we'll obviously, as an organisation, keep pushing for that. Um, and one of the, obviously, it's very important that we, um, yes, as Bill mentioned, consider all aspects of things. Matt, are you ready for the treasure? Yeah, I might just take it from the seat, if that's okay. Just like you might take people through it on the screen. All right, I want to get with the microphone. Beautiful. I will stand here for the purpose of giving our viewers at home something to look at. Am I on? Yes. You're on. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I would also like to thank Andrew Janellen for reviewing these accounts and thank you to Mark for preparing them. Um, the position is quite straightforward. We are a small organisation. Um, and last year our income was, for the last financial year, $1,010. Now, I will note, and it's not reflected here in these financial statements, that um, while there were a number of member um, subscriptions during the year membership fees, it was a significant amount of uh, generous donations from some of the members in order to make up shortfalls for that period. And we, I would say we were heavily reliant on uh, donations for that period to cover our expenses, the primary two being our public liability 
insurance and our website management software. Um, because of that, um, we ended the financial year with $379 in the bank. Um, it's a relatively straightforward situation. I would say also in terms of that expenditure, there were also additional expenditures, expenses of the organisation which were met directly by members. Um, we're hoping to change that going forward into the next financial year. We now have 38 financial members, which is a significant increase compared to this time last year. Um, much of that is thanks to the website. So once again, um, the good work that the people at Transit Graphics has done has put this organisation on a much better financial footing and we're in a much stronger position. Um, of that, I don't think there's too much more to say in relation to the financial position. So I would move that uh, the financial statements be uh, accepted by this organisation. Thank you. We've got a second from Roger. Thank you, Roger. Show of hands. Bravo. Thank you. Um, we also need to move the minutes. We do it. That's okay. Yes. Um, I'll just bring that up. Minutes of last year. You may recall this time last year was a, a, um, a difficult time for us all. COVID was especially specifically Omicron was, was causing a great deal of fun um, in our wonderful part of town. I watched the video, I didn't even remember being there. <laughs> there is my voice <laughs> moving all these things. <laughs> I, remember, I remember it a great deal. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes, obviously we have the 2021 um, minutes for the PTCBR AGM. Um, I moved that they be accepted. Seconded by Mark. Show of hands for adoption of the 2021 minutes. Fantastic. Well done. Um, and we, oh look, we'll, we'll just move on to the next bit. Um, we move on to the 2023 committee of PTCBR. As there have been sufficient nominations received and no contested positions, I would like to announce as the elected PTCBR committee for 2022-23, I will continue as chair for at least another year. Um, yeah. We'll have um, uh, Damien Haas as deputy chair. Oh. Mark will continue as treasurer. Uh, Matt will continue as our Secretary and Public Officer and what a fantastic job he has done. And we will continue to have Murray, Bill and Robert as General Committee members. And I would like to extend a, a big thank you to our outgoing committee members, uh, Colette Robinson and Mark Dando, both of whom who have been instrumental in guiding PTCBR over this significant period of change. But this I will say this, this is not goodbye. We are actually changing how at PTCBR we conduct our policy formulation process. And we're very keen to make sure that everyone is involved, all our members are involved in the development of our transport policy going forward. So we'll obviously provide more information about how we intend to do that in the coming years, but we intend to host more of, of these sorts of events and certainly um, some events more where people get the chance to like talk at length about the, um, the issues that they find important. So we look forward to that being a priority of the Public Transport Association in the next coming year. And with that, I would like to declare the 2022 PTCBR AGM closed. <laughs>